Hi there. Greetings. My name is Guy Dornsey. This is the show called Change the World, or here on Spotlight. And I like to invite guests on who have a positive vision for the future and are not just whining and groaning and being cynical. So we have done with that stuff. We're talking positive vision. And my guest is Laurel Collins, a new City of Victoria councillor and very active at UVic. We'll come to that as well. And also now the NDP candidates become Member of Parliament for Victoria. Yes. So... In the period running up to saying, I'm going to run for council, what was going on in your mind? You know, I got involved in municipal politics um, by founding an organization called Divest Victoria. So asking the municipal government to take its money, its investments out of the fossil fuel industry yes. and put it into environmentally sustainable investments. Very important. Yes. Yeah. And so I've been doing a lot of climate activism, environmental activism, you know, protecting watersheds, making yeah. sure that we have strong policies when it comes to reducing our greenhouse gases. Right. And so a lot of my impetus was around wanting to make sure that we have strong climate policies at the local level. Right. But also, um, you know, as most people know, Victoria is in a housing crisis. Yes. Uh, and so I was seeing that, you know, as a renter, whenever uh, renters are looking for a place to live, it's very hard to find a place to live here in Victoria. And then also all of, you know, my friends, the people I, yeah. I know are struggling whether it is you know, seniors on fixed incomes or um, people who want to buy a home. Yeah. I really want to make a difference, and I think there's a lot we can do on the... So, so I know from your background you've been active with the Victoria Labour Council, with Victoria's Women in Need, um, with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Uganda, you were Executive Director of the Victorian Multicultural Society, author of a book on women, adult education and leadership. When you think back to yourself as a 10-year-old or 12-year-old, what led you to the direction of getting engaged to make a difference in the world? You know, I, when I was 10, uh, so my family, like many families, uh, experienced poverty and experienced, um, you know, the emotional challenges of having a father addicted to alcohol. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those experiences growing up, uh, seeing my mom as a single mom, raising three kids, it made me, it made it really personal to me to want right. to address social inequality, right. make sure that we actually have solutions when it comes to addressing poverty. Right. Uh, and then looking at that both locally, but then also globally. And that so, was part of my impetus. So your empathy got awakened? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think there are so many things around the world that we need to address when it comes to yeah. addressing social inequality, but also here at home. It is just atrocious to me that we still have places in Canada that don't have clean access to drinking water. Yeah. And, well, yeah. that we have in, in one of the most comfortable developed places on the planet, we have people who sleep on the streets. It's wild. Yeah. It is unconscionable. Yeah. yeah. There's something seriously wrong yeah. with the way of doing that. And so, um, who persuaded you to run for council? You know, there were a number of people. Uh, a couple of the current sitting councillors approached me about running. Okay. Uh, a lot of the people who I was doing activism work, so my co-chair of Divest Victoria, yes. um, the other people I've been doing climate activism with, uh, people who were organizing for Housing for All, right. uh, kind of all encouraged me. Uh, there was a long period where I was saying, maybe, no, I don't think it's for me. Politics seems... Uh. I heard someone, I forget it was, said that you have to ask women, can women potential candidates three times more than men potential candidates because they're weighing the things up so much more. Yeah, that, and I think also that comes to social conditioning. Oftentimes women are told, uh, you know, they're, they're inexperienced or they're told uh, that you have to kind of achieve this extra yes. level. Um, and so I think that probably works so into it, it, it as well. It, it, it's, aside from all the practical stuff we're going to get to, do you meet resistance from important, self-important men who think that you shouldn't be telling them what to do? Uh, I think, like many women, I've definitely experienced sexism and uh, I see that out in the world all the time and yeah. I'm actively working to address it, whether it's the small kind of micro yeah. um, pieces of it or the larger pieces right. where, you know, I worked for Victoria Women in Need supporting women who mm -hmm. were fleeing violence or who were yeah. taking, or taking the step out of transition houses yeah. into their own housing. So now you're a city councillor for the first time and you have the first council meeting. Is it as you expected, or what's, what's with, what was the surprises you got from actually being a councillor as opposed to watching it from the outside? Yeah, you know, when you're uh, pushing from the outside mm. as an activist and an advocate, uh, you don't always realize the, some of the limitations uh, and how the bureaucracy and, you know, our staff is 
absolutely incredible at the city, but it takes a while when you are doing these bold, big policy changes. Yes. It's an entire ship that you have to turn, and it is a slow turn. And I, you know, a lot of the work that I've been doing, the policies uh, and the motions that I've been putting forward are to accelerate our climate leadership plan, yeah. to put forward bold policies on housing. and. Yeah. Uh, you know, we want it to happen right away, but it's going to take a bit. So, a bit of history here. When I arrived in Victoria in 1990, I was on the Victoria Environment Advisory Committee, and um, I was chairing it. And we put, we developed a whole climate strategy and platform, which the city said, yes, yes, that's fine. And they gave it to someone, and we never heard anything of it ever since. That was 30 years ago. Oh. It is tragic Painful. to me to hear that. Yeah. yeah. And we now have an incredible climate leadership plan. And it was developed uh, last year uh, with a lot of input. And it was focused on 2050. Yes. And when I got elected and then December came and we got the IPCC report yes. uh, that said we have less than 12 years to meet our climate targets. Yes. So I passed a motion saying, actually, we need to accelerate our climate right. leadership plan. We need to be looking at 2030. And so our staff is actively engaged on that. They are bringing back a report to us about how we're going to do that. Some of the really big things, which, you know, it's not as sexy, but things like uh, replacing oil pumps, you know? Well, I was going to ask about that because on the website, the Climate Action Plan clearly says 80% reduction by 2050, 100% renewable energy by 2050, which I was part of helping to persuade. And I thought, and but it's 2030 it's, is what we need stuff for. Absolutely, and so that's what the staff is working on right now. It's updating that plan, using the same uh, you know, skeleton of that plan, but looking at how we get to our goals Have by 2030. thought of setting up a, a citizens' assembly or some much larger group to, to build? Because you can't get change without community grassroots support as well. And I know, being staff, your desk is always full. <laughs> Yeah, and you know we have staff who are very dedicated to this, yes. and they are going to start workshops yes. first with council to talk about how we're going to accelerate some yes. of this. But then we're going to be reaching out to the community to make sure because we can't do it alone. We can change our corporate right. uh, structures, but we actually right. need the community so to shift just, with us. So we just got an electric vehicle. So I've been tuning into the the recharging process, and I realized, and I read somewhere that if you live on a street, when you park on the street, you don't know where you're going to park each night. So how do you plug in? So the very practical stuff that you know, the electric vehicle revolution, right? The new cars this year will have a 400 kilometer range, and the price is falling all the time. So it's going to just click into crucial in the next two or three years, but the charging infrastructure is going to have to be there. Absolutely, and that's one of the things we've been uh, working on at City Hall is how to make sure that we have the infrastructure here yeah. in Victoria uh, for the coming changes. Right. And part of that is making sure that all new developments have those charging stations in them. Yeah. Um, but for people who are parking on the street, you know, there are now the stage three chargers, which take about 45 minutes. And we want to make sure that there are chargers available yeah, where people can go. The, the, I've read that, that when you use so stage three too often, you're wearing out your battery much faster. So you've got a flip side to that. But every lamppost, has electricity in it. If they could be wired for 240 volts, you just put part by a lamppost and you plug into that maybe, then you've got to say who's paying for it. But the cost of electricity is so nothing. I love that idea. I think we need to have those kind of creative yeah. solutions. So well, that's that we why having a citizens assembly around climate stuff, get this creativity and they'll bring it all together. I love it. People can feel involved, right? Yeah. So when the provincial government, our NDP government, announced their Clean BC climate plan on electric vehicles, they said that by 2040, every new vehicle must be electric. And I thought, oh, why wait? So that needs to be by 2025, quite frankly. And you know what I I'm excited to see a lot of what's in Clean BC and especially around incentives. Um, you know the federal government and the provincial government are now incentivizing yes. uh, EVs uh, and and ha us having a ZEV man mandate I think is going to actually allow well, for the. So I'm going to decode you. ZEV yeah. mandate oh, sorry, is yes. zero emissions vehicle <laughs> mandate, which means yeah. electric car. Absolutely. So having that mandate means that we'll actually have the supply available for people to. Uh, I and I honestly think that the changes are coming. They are. Uh, you know, and it, it makes uh, economic sense. Yeah. More and more people are seeing that. Uh, I think it's going to be changing very, very so rapidly. So when people complain about gas prices, a gas-powered car is $2,400 to run. Electric car is $350 to run a year. So I'm saving $2,000 a year on gas, which I'm not paying at all. And the average and the servicing cost is $59 after one year. Whereas normally with a regular car, you take it in for servicing, you think it's 200 and you come out with a bill for 800 because they found something. 
Yeah, and electric vehicles are just one aspect of that. We need yes, a mode obviously. shift in so many different ways. Yes. Transportation, we need to make it more accessible, more affordable. We need our city to be incredibly walkable. Uh, totally. Yeah. Make sure that we have the cycling infrastructure yep. necessary, that people can do that with their families. Yes. Uh, we, we really need that transportation piece needs to be a core part of yeah. how we're going to reduce our greenhouse gases. And buildings? Yes. You know, buildings are, I think they're the third largest emitters of greenhouse gases in our country. But they're second uh, for us because our electricity is green already. So it's just buildings and transport, really. Yeah. And uh, that's, so that's across Canada. But buildings are essential. And so for at the city level, at the local level, we are uh, accelerating the STEP code. And so the STEP code is a provincial uh, kind of structure yes. that sh mandates how uh, energy efficient buildings right. are going to be. And right now, it's up to local governments on how fast you actually implement that. But, but with the federal, with the provincial legislation, it says that by 2032, every new building must be zero net energy ready. Why wait till 2032? In, in Brussels, in Belgium, in 2011, they said that by 2015, every house must be a passive house. And, and in four years, they achieved it. And we actually don't have to wait. It is up to municipal governments. Okay. And so right now it's scheduled that in 2020, and so at the end, end yes. of this year, we'll go up a step uh, to step two. Um, yeah. And so what we want to do is look at how quickly we can accelerate that. And yeah. so that's what our staff is working around it. They're, they're going to bring well, it back great, to us. I, I can quite recall in winter when you see the snow on the roofs and you can easily find out who's got insulation or not, seeing new houses built recently with the snow melting off the roofs because they haven't got the insulation in the attic, right? Um, on Gabriola, they've got a program through Sustainable Gabriola when they, they share um, not just a, a watt meter so people can actually find out what, how much energy has been drawn, but also a an infrared um, camera so you can immediately see where heat is leaking from a building to help it, which is every neighborhood should have one of those so we can all every household needs to work on that stuff and that's we're talking about new buildings being built but we actually want to also focus on older buildings well, and retrofitting yeah. and that's 90 percent of the challenge that's kind of where i shift into the federal uh conversation yes. and there are incredible things we could be doing at the federal level when it comes to incentivizing retrofits yes. uh, the federal ndp just announced a retrofit program where people actually won't have to pay a dime uh, what they'll do is uh, they get interest-free loans where those loans are then paid back by the money that you save yeah. on your energy bill. Yeah. And so it doesn't cost uh, consumers anything, um, but it is a long-term program, so it actually creates jobs. It means that those people well, who are in the retrofit business yeah. can uh, you know, hire people. It, it is just a sensible policy. That program has been around for the, the idea so but long. On and Why off. did it take the Liberals four years until their last six months to roll it out? Yeah, and it also, because it's on and off, means that those companies who are doing the retrofits can't maintain their businesses. We need yeah. something that isn't just a, a yeah. pilot or a short-term pro yes. program. So I know you're also now officially running to be the NDP candidate for the federal election, to yeah. be a member of parliament. And I'll come back to that in a second, but straight into the... the issue of climate change, yeah. the current federal the NDP is supporting the provincial NDP in liquefied natural gas development, which is a complete contradiction in terms. Where do you stand if you're elected and you're in the NDP and your party leader is supporting natu liquefied natural gas? And I would argue that I don't think that the federal NDP is necessarily supporting uh, supporting well, that. Well, I verbally, think Jagmeet Singh came out and supported Organ on that. Yeah, and I what I... You know, my personal, Uncomfortable moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my personal stance yes. is that we need to move rapidly, yes. as, as quickly as possible, to a low carbon economy. Right. And I think that means investments in green infrastructure, in green energy yes. technology. And Jagmeet has been clear on that as well. When it comes to the federal uh, party's role yes. in these kind of projects, our role is actually around assessments. And we need to dramatically uh, shift the way in which federal assessments happen right. to actually incorporate the science yeah. of climate change. And that was something that Justin Trudeau, Trudeau ran on yeah. and did not So you've, use. you've spoken with Jagmeet Singh, right? What is the openness within an NDP caucus of elected members of parliament for people having different opinions with the leader yeah. and, and saying them publicly without being thrown out of caucus? <laughs> Um, what's, it, what's the game? So when I spoke uh, to Jagmeet, and actually just look, uh, listening to him in the House of Commons yesterday, yes. uh, he was saying 
our energy system, like the future of energy in Canada, it's not fracking, it's not burning, it's not um, yeah. fossil fuels. It is green energy. I actually think that uh, we have a NDP caucus who are incredibly committed to climate change, who yeah. realize we have less than 12 years and realize the urgency of that and who want to do it in a way, who understand that we need to do it in a way yeah. that links up uh, reducing our greenhouse gases with job creation, with yeah. what, what we've been calling a Green New Deal. So Britain's Labour Party has declared a climate emergency. Yeah. Is Canada's NDP going to do the same thing? Ooh, you know, I haven't spoken to the rest of the caucus, but uh, you know, at the at the city level, we declared a climate yeah, emergency. I want to know, what, would, what would it take to persuade the NDP coming into the election to yeah. put their saying, "This is where we stand. We have a climate emergency. We need to deal with it." Yeah, and I, I will have that conversation. I, yeah, I honestly, we are in a. Would, would you line up three or four sympathetic MPs first before you have the conversation, so it's not just one of you? I mean, I think... Good politics, right? <laughs> I would, if it was Honestly, me. Honestly, like, I think that we have an NDP caucus who understands that this right. is an emergency, that it is a crisis, yeah. that we need bold action on this. Yeah. Um, I don't feel too concerned about having that conversation. Good, yeah. good. Because it, it troubles me that in, in British Columbia, I know there are got to be NDP MLAs who don't support fracking and LNG, but as far as we're concerned, they've got duct tape over their mouths. You know, they they're not going to peep. It's all... Yeah, and... And it's a total... Con you cannot get the climate goals we need and expand fossil fuel action at the same time. And, you know, I'm not going to speak for other no, for elected sure. officials. Sure. Yeah. Um, I can speak to my commitment to yes. climate action, to climate leadership. That, And I can also speak to what I've seen from the NDP, which is that they are going to be yes. coming out with a bold climate leadership plan that shows a clear path yes. uh, from our current economic model to a low carbon reality. Yeah. And I am so excited about that. So how frustrated are you that the Green Party are speaking with similar intensity, similar goals, similar vision, and running parallel campaigns separate from the NDP? You know, I, I have a lot of respect for people who vote Green, who yes. run for the Green Party. Yeah. Um, I do think the NDP offers something uh, you know, that speaks to my values and is the, the combination of social and environmental justice. Uh, yeah. It is prioritizing the climate and prioritizing people, making sure that we actually are dealing with the real issue of economic inequality yeah. at the same time that we're dealing with the climate crisis. Yeah. How do you, I've seen stuff in the papers about people saying, I just worked hard to get Laurel elected as a councillor, now she's off to Ottawa. And they're feeling like you should, you should wait. What, what's your feeling, response to that kind of? You, know, you must be getting that feedback too. It, it was a really hard decision for me, so I understand how yes. it would be hard for other people. You know, I yes. I love council. I yeah. think that there's such a potential to make really incredible change at the local level. Yes. And I know that I'm leaving the council in really good hands. We yes. have a number of councillors who are committed to social and environmental yes. justice, but also. Uh, we have less than 12 years. Right. We are in a climate crisis. We need a federal government who takes the climate crisis seriously. Yes. And that is why I'm stepping forward. Right. Do you worry that if you, if you get elected and you're MP and you're in opposition or in, and you're just chomping at the teeth and you're just frustrated because you can't get anything done and blah, 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 and there's no proportional voting and it just makes you tear your hair out? You know, it was one of the things that I was struggling with when I was making my decision. Right yeah. now on council, I can put forward motions. Yes. I'm legislating, you know, uh, you governing. You have power. You can make things happen. <laughs> yeah. You could be an NDP and new mem member of parliament. And, and I think there's an incredible opportunity in this uh, upcoming election. Yes. I do think that we have a big probability that it will be a minority government. Uh, and when I have looked back on yeah. NDP minority governments at the federal level, they have made huge changes when it comes to pensions, right. when it comes to Medicare for all, yeah. and we have an opportunity to take, take that next bold step for Canada, and universal pharmacare, universal daycare, you know, a bold and climate it, it, leadership plan. It may be that if Andrew Scheer c continues with his plan to run on opposition to the carbon tax, he could be the biggest mistake they're making because it's going to be a national debate about it, which is what we want. Yeah. And, and we have to deal with this yes. stuff. Yes. And they have no plan at all. They've got nothing to substitute it with. Yeah, it's wild. It's, yeah. yeah. So then, if you're then potentially working in, part, in coalition with the Liberals, 
in the run-up to that, you have to be careful not to, to offend too many of them, right? <laughs> you know, I th what I've uh, seen in politics is that we can have vehement disagreements yes. on policies and on issues. And as long as you are respectful yeah. to people, you can work with them. Well, Elizabeth May is a wonderful role model of that because she's certainly got very passionate views and I'm a strong supporter. And she's friendly with so many other MPs because they're all working together in their own way, right? And I see the same thing uh, in previous NDP uh, MP, Megan Leslie, who worked yes. across lines, yes. was respected by all parties. Yes. Uh, and I, that is the kind of MP that I want to be. Right. Yeah. So. As, as well as the climate issues, um, some of the social change issues, what, what, what passion would you be carrying to Ottawa to get stuff achieved on that? If you, had a, if you find yourself a minister and you find yourself in coalition and you've got a private little list, these are things are going to get done in the next, what are they? Yeah, you know, I uh, would want proportional representation. Yes. Uh, you know, I would love to be the, the, you know, working on the climate crisis. Of course, that's, you know, yes. my area of passion. And yes. what, but we also, and one of the things that I've been working a lot on as a city councillor on and have worked on advocating for is uh, affordable housing. Yes. And these things actually connect to the climate crisis and our solutions for yeah. it because I want to see us investing in building affordable housing and building cooperative housing in a way that's actually building energy efficient buildings that where we can really see how we can meet our goals for social justice and for environmental well, justice I've been, together. I've been working on the climate file for years and the, the, the affordable housing crisis gives us the opportunity to role model affordable passive houses because the yeah. passive house design in Victoria was only 4% more than regular house and has no heating bills. So the fuel poverty and the struggles with, with that sort of stuff is, is out of the way. And if they're also designed to be run by cooperatives so that people have self-management. And you know the financing, have you looked into the potential for Canada's central bank to actually issue zero interest loans to finance cooperative housing? I, yeah, and I would love to see us look at the models that were used in the 70s and early yeah. 80s to make sure that we actually are allowing co uh, cooperatives to thrive. You know, yeah. I want us to invest in affordable housing, invest in cooperative housing, but also create those finance, fan, financing models that actually work for cooperatives. Because Germany has a specific public bank that does all the financing for all their home retrofits. Wow. And they can, as a bank, if I've got $10 in the bank, I can create another 90 out of thin air and invest it as it's a loan, it comes back. That's how, so your face tells me. I love it, no, I haven't heard yeah. that about well, this that is, before. This is the dilemma between the people who understand environmental stuff and the economic stuff. Banks create money whenever they make a loan. So they don't have the money, they create 10 times more than they have. And central banks create money out of pure trust in the nation. It's all based on trust. It's not out of thin air. And so a central bank can actually print money for central banks at the moment are committed to keep inflation down and in America to keep unemployment down as well, they could be given another mandate to tackle national emergencies. Which in World War II, World War I, we print the money. And if climate is an emergency and affordable housing an emergency, you can then literally print the money to finance that stuff. And it doesn't, it's in such small quantities that it doesn't cause mega inflation or any problems like that. And what you're talking about also relates to what we're talking about in the Green New Deal, uh, which is treating yeah. the climate crisis like the emergency it right. is, yes. and then investing in it in the same way you know, that yeah. Roosevelt did for the Great Depression. Well, all the investments that have a return on them, whether it's you know, solar energy, wind energy, retrofits, they all have a good return. That can be public, public bank financed with money that doesn't need to come out of taxation. That's the critical difference, because otherwise the Conservatives will be saying, oh, you've got to have taxes, you've got to raise taxes, or you've got to cut programs. You know, it's that, not true. That, and that argument uh, always bothers me, <laughs> because we, there are ways we can find money. You know, Trudeau found $4.5 billion to yes. buy a pipeline true. with public money. Yes. No one asked him, how are you going to pay for it? Yes. But uh, if we end subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, if we, uh, yep. you know, actually close the loopholes on, uh, you know, the wealthiest in Absolutely. our society, and all the tax havens, yes, stuff. we could be spending that money yes. on investing in clean energy, yes. in green jobs. And in addition to that, a public a, a public bank owned by the people of Canada can create the money needed to invest in all these projects. That's how Germany does it. It's I'm not excited a, you know, to yeah. look into that more, honestly. Yeah. I, I wish that stuff was more in public debate about how we can solve these problems. because it is, it is a crisis. And we, when we come to World War II or World War I, there was no, people got it, we just got it done. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned your, your wish list, proportional voting. Yep. Uh, address the climate crisis. The climate crisis, yes. Affordable housing. Affordable, yes. Uh, you know, 
And then I also, I'm really excited about where the uh, NDP is moving when it comes to universal pharmacare and right. universal daycare. Yes. I would also love to see universal dental care. Yes. Uh, you know, when we think about uh, Tommy Douglas's dream yes. of universal health care, uh, you know, the fact that people are still struggling to pay for their prescriptions yeah. are having to choose between paying for rent or yeah. paying for their medication. Yeah. It is unconscionable. It, yeah. It's just atrocious to me. And I think that we have a huge opportunity to actually create universal health care, which includes paying for medication. Yeah. Yeah. And um, is that is that get traction on when you're door knocking and talking to people, these kind of ideas? You know, there's a lot of people and, you know, especially when I'm talking to seniors on fixed incomes yeah. uh, who are struggling to pay for yeah. medication, that right. it is needed. Yeah. Um, affordable housing, everyone I speak to is like, yes, we need to address this like a crisis. So have you got a family and children and things like that? I have a niece and nephew who okay. I adore. They live up in Shawnigan Lake. So, um, so going to Ottawa and they're flying and the time you can handle all I that, I have right? a, a very uh, supportive partner Good. Um, <laughs> who understands how much I will be away. Um, yes. But also, I'll be here in Victoria I'm connecting with residents as well. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Our time is running out on us, you know, and you're, you're standing to be our Member of Parliament. Yeah. Any final thoughts you want to say to the viewers? You know, um, one of the things you said before we started the program was around kind of uh, happiness and empathy. Yes. And uh, I think one of the things that often kind of gets lost in these policy deb debates is how important it is that we are creating the kind of social fabric, um, the empathy and compassion in our communities that's required and is going to be necessary with the coming changes when it comes to the climate crisis. Yeah. Uh, and I. You know, I want us to be addressing all of these policy issues, and I also think um, well-being and in inclusion yeah. and social fabric is an important part of that. But the, the, the Labour Party in Britain has a, they're talking about community wealth development. Yes. So it's not just GDP and making money, but it's the wider out. Community wealth means relationships. It yes. means nature. It means public meeting spaces. It means affordable housing. It means good transit. Yeah. So if we focus on building community wealth. That's a goal more important than just GDP, right? Yeah, you know, I have a good friend who is doing research on empathy, uh, and she talked about replumbing cities. And so I think it's Chicago. They l literally lifted the buildings to replumb, yeah. uh, to plumb for the first time, to put in plumbing. Yeah. And uh, we want to think about our communities and how we do that same thing when it comes to empathy. How do we infuse our. So you just lift every house up and put the empathy pipe in underneath, and <laughs> yes. everyone's feeling, oh, no, I care about my neighbors <laughs> and the climate. Well, look, Laurel, thank you so much for your leadership on this one, both at council and then standing to be MP. Thank you for creating the space for these conversations. It's really important. Yeah. yeah. So my guest has been Laurel Collins, um, Victoria City Councillor and NDP candidate to be Member of Parliament for Victoria. My name is Guy Dauncey. One of my contributions is this novel I wrote called Journey to the Future, A Better World is Possible, set in Vancouver in the year 2032, which really gives a, a vibrant vision of how the world can be if we do all these things we're talking about. If you enjoy this kind of program, tune in next week and there's more to come. Thanks for watching.